Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Few women have been more highly favored by God and thus more highly honored by us than Mary Magdalene. Certainly she was a woman full of faith and good works. And yet we remember her first of all, because she was first of all to see our risen Lord. It was not to Peter that Jesus first appeared. It was not to John. It was not to his own mother that Jesus first appeared. But Mary Magdalene was the first who could say those welcome words, I have seen the Lord. Mary was likely born in a town called Magdala, on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Her title, Magdalene, leads us to believe this. And her title also helps us distinguish her from the other Marys who come up in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 8, the evangelist lists some of the women who have been accompanying Jesus. And among them, he names Mary, called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out. Mary had been severely tormented by the devil and his minions. They lorded over her and claimed her as their subject. Yet we see, even from the little that we know of her situation, that there is a Lord who is stronger than the devil, a Lord whom the devil must own as Lord, and to whom the devil must give way. Jesus is Lord, and Mary experienced his gracious lordship when he cast the seven demons out of her. It's no wonder that Mary very personally laments at the tomb, they have taken away my Lord. Without this Lord, who is there to defend us against the evil one? But Jesus abandons neither her nor us to lament. What Jesus has shown in his entire life, his death, his resurrection, the truth of 1 John 3, verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The women who are listed in Luke chapter 8, in addition to accompanying Jesus and his disciples, also provided for them out of their means. This likely indicates that Mary was well off and had money to spare. But even if she wasn't wealthy, we nevertheless see her generosity. And of all the things on which she could have spent her money, she thought it of greatest importance that Jesus should be able to conduct his ministry and train his apostles without any of them having to wonder where their food or clothing or shelter would come from. Now after Pentecost and the persecution in Jerusalem, the apostles were dispersed over the face of the earth and were presumably cared for by those whom they were serving, just as parish pastors in our day are taken care of by their congregations. But during that time, the apostles spent studying under Jesus what we might call their seminary years. Mary and others provided for the needs of the apostles, such that they were less distracted with earthly cares. We can be imitators of Mary's generosity and care for the formation of ministers by supporting seminary students. Not only does it do a great service to them as individuals, but it also does a great service to the church. It allows men to focus on learning the word of Jesus, which the better they know, the better they're able to care for Jesus' flock. But we also see in Mary's generosity the humiliation of our Lord. After all, she didn't just provide for the apostles, but she provided for Jesus himself. Jesus is that word through whom the whole creation was made. The world depends on him, and he is not the least bit dependent on it, at least not according to his divine nature. Since he is 
true God, Jesus can say in Psalm 50, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. But when the Son of God was made man in his incarnation, according to our humanity, he became like us, dependent on the creation and its creator for his bodily needs. Even though Jesus could have had a miraculous catch of fish or a multiplication of loaves every day, nevertheless, he was made like his brothers in every way, save without sin. And so Jesus not only taught us to pray the fourth petition, but he prayed it himself. Give us this day our daily bread. And it was through Mary Magdalene that the Father in heaven provided for the bodily needs of his Son. Now when it comes to receiving gifts from God, we know enough to say, I'm not worthy that I should receive them. But consider that we say something very similar when we're giving things to God. I'm not worthy that I should give this. Mary might have said, Lord, this was yours before it was mine. And certainly it hasn't increased in value or honor by belonging to me. If anything, it's been tainted by the hands of a sinner. And you deserve better than this. And yet, you thank me for it. And you thank God for me. In this, you teach me and all your people how low you stooped to raise us up from the depths of sin and hell. Now there are some speculations about the life of Mary Magdalene. Traditionally, the church has identified Mary Magdalene with the sinner woman in Luke chapter 7, who came to Jesus while he was dining with the Pharisee, who anointed his feet with myrrh and wet them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Perhaps that identification is correct, but we have nothing in scripture to indicate whether it is or not. Another speculation about Mary Magdalene, and this one coming from the unbelieving world and not from the church, is that Mary Magdalene was the wife of Jesus. Now we can say for certain that that speculation is false. According to Ephesians chapter 5, Christ only has one bride, namely the church as a whole, and not an individual human woman. But let's move back to the firm ground of Holy Scripture. The next thing we can say for certain about Mary, and this is her greatest honor, is that she was a witness of Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. It says in John chapter 19, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So she saw very clearly that it was indeed Jesus and not someone else hanging on the cross. It says in Mark chapter 15 that at the death of Jesus there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. So Mary heard Jesus' final cry, and felt that earthquake that took place at his death. At Jesus' burial, it says in Matthew chapter 27, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. And in Mark 15, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Mary saw the corpse up close, and was able to say for a fact, yes, that is Jesus, and yes, he is dead. And then finally you heard how she witnessed the resurrection. The evangelists all make a point to show the eyewitness testimony surrounding Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. Contrast this with Mormonism which asks its adherents simply to take Joseph Smith's word for it, for their beliefs. He supposedly read magical tablets out of a hat, which nobody else could read, and dictated it for somebody to write down. That became the Book of Mormon, confirmed by no one. Or contrast Christianity with Islam. 
Who saw Mohammed take his night flight? Who saw his supposed ascension into heaven? Who saw the angel appear to him and confirm that the words of the Quran are indeed the words of God? He has no sign to confirm these words, and there were no eyewitnesses. But not so with the death and resurrection of our Lord. Mary and others saw these things firsthand. This eyewitness testimony became a standard part of apostolic preaching. We heard Paul preach in Acts chapter 13, but God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now witnesses to the people. As much as to say, if you doubt this, you can go and ask them. Ask them all, and they will all tell you the same thing. Peter likewise preached in Acts chapter 10. But God raised him on the third day, and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us, who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And among those chosen by God as witnesses, the one who was shown the most favor was Mary Magdalene, who was chosen to be the first to see our resurrected Lord. The record of the day of resurrection in John's Gospel, which we heard read, is markedly different from the accounts of the day of resurrection in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not by any means contradict the other accounts, but he focuses on Mary Magdalene, as the first to see Jesus risen from the dead. Now there are several ways to harmonize the accounts of the resurrection from the four Gospels, and we can't say for sure which harmonization is what actually happened, since there are multiple ways to take all the facts into account. It seems that there was a group of women who set out early in the morning, among whom was Mary Magdalene, who went to the tomb, saw the stone rolled away, and saw a vision of angels who said that Jesus was raised from the dead. They went and reported back to the apostles, saying that they had seen an angel, and that Jesus was raised from the dead, though they had not seen him up to this point. Then Peter and John ran to the tomb, as we heard in the reading, peeked in and saw that it was as they said, that the tomb was empty and the stone was rolled back. And it seems that Mary Magdalene accompanied them on the return to the tomb, and that as she stood there, the angels reappeared in the tomb, since Peter and John did not see them. They must have returned at some point. Mary stoops in, sees the angels, and they ask her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she answered, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now we learn two things from her response. First, the comfort of Easter is not the empty tomb. Mary saw the empty tomb. She saw that the body of Jesus wasn't there. And that only led her to weep the more. The empty tomb is no comfort. The only thing that would be a comfort for Mary Magdalene is if Jesus was alive. And that is the comfort of Easter. Second, you heard how she identified her Lord with his body. She did not say, they have taken away my Lord's corpse, but they have taken away my Lord. Jesus showed himself to be our Lord by coming in the flesh. If his body dies, we don't conclude, oh, the Son of God has simply resumed his previous state of being purely a spirit without a body, that's fine. No, ever since the Incarnation, if the body of Jesus dies and stays dead, then the Son of God stays dead. We must then lose all hope and despair of ever being saved. And so we see that Mary was not just weeping at the loss of a personal friend, but was weeping for herself and for all mankind who must be doomed if Jesus is not alive. Then Mary turned and saw Jesus, though she mistook him for the garden. 
here we have the first day, a new creation. A garden different from the Garden of Eden, and certainly a gardener much different from Adam. And yet here is the return of the Garden of Eden. And here is the true gardener, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has died for Adam's sin and been raised from the dead, who lives forever and who has foiled all the plots of that ancient servant. It was not until Jesus called Mary by name that she recognized him. The sheep hear his voice, Jesus said in John chapter 10, and he calls his own by name and leads them out. Jesus said to her, Mary. And that's all it took. She turned and said, Rabboni, my teacher. And then Jesus sent her to bear one of the greatest words ever entrusted to a mortal being, the word of the resurrection. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Thanks be to God for Mary Magdalene and for the testimony that she bore. We say the Lord is risen, and the response is not, at least we think so. But because of the eyewitnesses of whom Mary is the first, what do we say? The Lord is risen! He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Indeed, we say, indeed, really, truly, actually, certainly. Because of this firm and reliable eyewitness testimony, you can look death in the face and you can laugh. Jesus has died for your sins. He was raised in order to justify you, to declare you righteous before God. And he has joined you to himself in his death and resurrection by the waters of holy baptism. This is no shot in the dark. This is no man reading tablets out of a magical hat. This is no angel giving mystical visions in a cave. This is the firmly established truth. Glory be to Christ, who gave Mary Magdalene such greatness and honor, and through her, has given enduring hope and comfort to his church. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.